Welcome. We are just going to we are just going to get started. A couple of more people are joining, but a couple of minutes past, so let's get started. Welcome, everyone. It's good to have you on board. We're here today to talk about biodiversity net gain and water courses. And today's webinar is one of three. On the 23rd of January, we spoke with Natural England and DEFRA about the statutory biodiversity metric. On the 25th of January, we went through mandatory biodiversity net gain policy. And today, yes, come on watercourses, it's your turn. We're gonna go roll up our sleeves and get to the ins and outs of watercourse biodiversity net gain. Now, as we go through today, please use the Q&A. Um, there's a chat function if you need any IT support, but if you want to ask your questions, please do use the Q&A. Before we get going, I'd like to bring in Nick, if that's okay. Nick, there's been last minute changes and we know actually just how much DEFRA and Natural England are really listening to feedback about the guidance and everything that, that's coming, come, coming up to the place of mandatory net gain. We spoke on the policy webinar about what can count, about the cap with no net loss, whether it's on or off site. And there have been some final, final tweaks. So we will clarify this on the YouTube video as well, but could you clarify those final tweaks today? Yeah, thanks, Julia. And and thanks for the opportunity to come in and, and kind of clarify the, the position on this, um, because anyone that listened uh, on the other webinar, I, I gave a slightly uh, misleading uh, view, so opportunity to correct. Um, so essentially, the rules in terms of what can count uh, apply equally for on and off site. So if you've got a um, on-site uh, features that you're providing as part of mitigation measures for, for example, European protected species, uh, they would get capped themselves at the equivalent of no more than no net loss in the same way as they would for off-site as well. Um, the guidance on gov.uk is in the process of being updated um, and I'm hopeful that what will come out will be clearer as well. There's also, my understanding is there's also going to be a table uh, set out that very clearly kind of illustrates what can and cannot count towards uh, or beyond no net loss. Um, so once that link is available, obviously we can we can send that around to, to folks as well. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted the opportunity to correct that because I think on the previous one, impression had been given I said actually it could count beyond uh, no net loss when in reality it will get capped at the equivalent of, of no net loss. And just to clarify so when we say no net loss is that literally the zero? Percent? It is yes yeah. so this is still all measured through the metric so for right. example to, to give an example uh, if you've got uh, kind of a, the development site and there are dormice on it and uh, what you're looking to do is to create some kind of put in some additional uh, uh, woodland or kind of uh, etc for yeah to, to meet the needs of the of the licensing for the dormice um, you couldn't in any circumstances get those habitat features to count towards more than the equivalent of no net loss for your development. And that will be this true equally if you've got a variety of different features for different needs on your site. So for example, if you had a site that had dormice and great crested newts, for example, um, you, you know, your, your ponds and your woodland in that scenario, I'm trying to think of a site that might do this, but um, again, you know, irrespective of what the metric calculation said, you can actually get it beyond no net loss. So it's, it's basically, requiring developers to say um, these are things that you're having to do anyway um, so they can contribute towards your biodiversity net gain but you could never in and of itself achieve biodiversity net gain purely by having delivered those outcomes you always have to do the extra minimum 10 percent which is good for nature nick thank you very much we really appreciate this Pleasure. so for everyone on the call um what can count the guidance is being updated and the no net loss CAP applies equally on and off site. Right then, let's start the show. I am so excited. I am really excited to bring in where we should be by diversity net gain for watercourses front and center of the discussion. So we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna to get to the ins and outs of what can be in the too difficult box, but no more. To join me today, we have Sarah and Lucy. Sarah, Lucy, would you mind introducing yourselves? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Sarah Scott. I'm a senior advisor in net gain in the Environment Agency, and I've led the development of the watercourses metric since 2018. I'm also a member of SIEM. 
I'm really excited to be here today and again just to focus on water courses so that's absolutely brilliant. I'll hand over to Lucy. Hi, hi there everybody. I'm Lucy Shuka. I'm an independent environmental consultant and advisor. Um, my background research has been in physical river sciences, so that's hydrology and geomorphology mainly, and interest, um, expertise, experience working in all different um, parts of the, the water sector, really, in consultancy, um, environment agency, catchment partnerships most recently. And I've been involved in the development of the method, which is uh, part of the river condition assessment. And also now I'm delivering training through SIEM for the, um, the watercourse part of the biodiversity metric. So we are in good hands. Should we start by going back? What's the history? What's the backstory of watercourse BNG and the biodiversity metric? Yeah, so a um, bit of history here. So I started working on BNG uh, back in 2018 uh, when I was dealing with a major development project in London. And it was the first time I'd ever heard the words biodiversity net gain. And it was also the first time I'd heard the words that BNG didn't apply to rivers. Um, obviously, this didn't go down well uh, in the Environment Agency. And I started to do some work on what um, it would look like uh, for rivers and streams. Uh, and through that work I did on this scheme, I ended up being seconded over to Natural England uh, metric team to lead the development of what was rivers and streams metric for version two. Um, and I've proudly uh, been involved ever since. Uh, so we've led from version two to statutory metric and it's just been brilliant. Uh, to see the changes. Um, um, most, if not all, have been directed from industry, uh, from those using the metric and applying the metric. So a big thank you. And yeah, I am hugely proud of it. Um, you know, the main aim here was not to make it a scientific study of rivers, but make it really applied. And over the years, the flavour of questions, I suppose, has changed. Started with what is condition uh, what's encroachment, then leading to markets. And now we're very much in that kind of a design stage. Um, and just kind of reflecting back on that that condition, that was a main thing that we had to get right first. And, and that's where I started working with Lucy, um, because we needed a condition assessment that was flexible and practical, practical for non-freshwater ecologists. So someone mentioned to me once about a catchment partnership meeting about a citizen science uh, technique about say what you see and it's kind of just rolled from there so Lucy I didn't know if you wanted to, to mention anything as well yeah thanks Sarah that's brilliant yeah so I've been really involved in river condition assessment um, methodology the development of it from from its early days when it started off as a, a citizen science method known as MORPH, which is a modular river physical habitat survey. Um, river condition assessment combines the MORPH survey with another desk study survey so that you can work out what river, type of river you're actually doing your assessment on. And the information from the MORPH field survey and the river type desk study gives really detailed information together about all the positive and negative attributes that you would see on a river that, that you're interested in surveying and then you assess that in relation to the specific type of river so that you're not comparing you know upland streams with lowland rivers and expecting everything to be coming up with all of the same uh, criteria. Um, this allows you to really get a good evaluation of the, the baseline and then also to predict future condition that's going to help you to understand what will be the right habitat in the right place for that particular type of river in that location. And I think it's it's so interesting. I always love hearing the backstory because I think that it's so much about, um, you know, the the heart of biodiversity net gain you know, has been people collaborating, people working together. And, and exactly what you've just said about, you know, where those kind of worlds collide, if you terms of, you know, the environment agency and we had the river um, condition assessment. Sarah, can we, while you're talking about the environment agency, on the webinars last week, we heard you know, from DEFRA about their role and they are in the metric now. And we also heard from Nick about the role of Natural England in mandatory net gain. Before we get too far into the details of watercourse net gain, what is the Environment Agency role when it comes to mandatory biodiversity net gain? Yeah, thanks, Julia. So, 
So the environment agency's ambition, you know, generally is to create a better environment for people and wildlife and support sustainable development. And um, we have responsibilities for water. So that's its quantity, its quality, its conservation and enhancement. And, and I think responsibilities, I think it's half the story here because in the EA, goodness, we're ambitious, we're tenacious, we're determined. We want to restore rivers, coasts and wetlands from source to sea. So it's in our DNA to carry out work with biodiversity in mind. So that's through our work as a developer, an advisor, but also as a water expert. So to be involved with BNG for the EA is a bit of a no brainer. Um, it's a vehicle to travel toward nature recovery, and it's a huge opportunity to restore rivers and streams. So very similar to, you know, Natural England, we're not a statutory consultee, um, but through our work as a developer, through advisor, you know, we'll still be involved in pre-apps and we will still be involved in shaping local policy and also being involved in metric um, going forward as our kind of water expert hat on. So yeah, quite quite a large role, I think, for BNG and huge opportunities. Thank you. And you just touched on it there, and and especially the you know the wonderful. I love the fact that you were like, hang on, you know, why is there no BNG for water courses, rivers? I I think we're missing something. But but just to really home tune this because we're now mandatory net gain and. So far, BNG watercourses has been in the too difficult box, and we will we will break it out. But but this is mandatory. So why why that? Okay, we need mandatory biodiversity net gain for rivers. Yeah, so I guess with with watercourses like any other habitat, they need ecological restoration. So like forty one percent of our rivers and streams are still not meeting eco ecological objectives. So. BNG does provide that huge opportunity uh, to help in that recovery. And talk about the two difficult box. Um, one thing I, I want to make clear, especially on the 12th of February, we'll touch on it a bit later, is that there is a line now. You know, we've been in this world of voluntary biodiversity net gain and maybe this, maybe that for water courses, um, but now mandatory net gain, the rules apply. So let's be absolutely clear when we come to that point that this is now mandatory and these are the rules, especially with water courses. We'll come back to that. So as a starting point as an ecologist, do I need to be a geomorphologist? And actually, when we were talking about um, this webinar, I was thinking, gosh, do I actually know what a geomorphologist is? So can we just start off with the, yeah. let's bust those urban myths. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, does an ecologist need to be a geomorphologist? Um, no. Uh, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, I think a lot of it's perception that rivers are difficult. I think there's always been a bit of a divide between kind of terrestrial and freshwater ecologists with that kind of bit of damp area in the middle. Um, and I think what we want to do here, and, and through this, you know, through this webinar, webinar, is we want to nudge people to be comfortable uh, to work on rivers. So not to be an expert, but be really comfortable working on rivers. And, and I suppose what we've des designed in the metric is fundamentally say what you see. So we haven't introduced kick samples. We've got no microfite sam samples. We've got no microscopes. Uh, and rivers, they really do tell really good stories uh, about the past and, and what they look like. You know, you've got issues, conflict, torture, love, potentially. Um, they're really good storytellers. And I think the more that we'll be able to, um, I guess as a community, read that story, um, the easier it will be. And I think that storytelling is something we want to pull out um, in this webinar today. But I'm gonna hand over to, to the geomorphologist to tell us what a geomorphologist is. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. That That's brilliant. I love that. Yeah, we have a lot of drama in these dynamic systems yeah. and we do love them very much when we work with them. Uh, it's a lovely thing to do to go be in the office by the river. Um, so I thought I'd talk first a little bit about what, what is a geomorphologist. And a geomorphologist is really um, someone who's really interested in landscapes and land forms and the processes that really create and sustain or um, sustain these landscapes and these land forms and, and how they change over time 
and at different spatial scales. So time and space is very important to us. In river science terms, a fluvial geomorphologist has expertise in the interactions between the water flow and the sediments that exist within our river systems, all the way from their spring sources down through the different parts of the, the, the river landscape, the tiny streams down through the big lowland rivers to the coast and along shorelines as well for, for coastal geomorphologists too. Um, so what we've got here is systems that are, are complex, dynamic, and it's a specialism, but it's also a supporting science that has actually got very many crossovers with, with other sciences that are going on around the rivers, the biodiversity and, and all the other ecological ones. Uh, so what a geomorphologist is really interested in is to understand these laws of nature and the natural physical processes and how these can really support good outcomes to sustain a physically healthy and sustainable functioning environment and ecosystem. So, yeah, it's quite straightforward, really. <laughs> and just thinking about it, it, it I mean, where do you start is, you know, in terms of and when we run the metric course, you know, we do a lot of prep before we go to site as an ecologist. Is that the kind of the same thing in terms of your world? So we've got the great slide up here, which um, I just wanted to run through. Yeah, and basically we have some kind of really nice uh, information that some of the, actually the Environment Agency national team have helped put together about some of the really top tips, the top needs to know about rivers. And, and these are very simply, um, let nature do the work, think, think bigger, connect these systems, give space and time to them and really, you know, plan and prioritize for all of the above, because in all of our river systems, we, we're going to have parts which are functioning well and naturally, and other parts which are really modified. And that natural function has been very impacted by the history, the physical changes that have happened over time, the channel straightening, widening, deepening, the diversions of channel channels there. So, this is the theory, but what does it actually mean in practice is the thing. So if we go on to the next slide, please, Julia. Wherever possible, we want to be working with natural processes. And we want these to basically be driving what we call nature-based restoration. And this is for our rivers and, and for our coasts as well. It may simply be a case of allowing rivers to recover naturally or to deliver some measures which will facilitate that recovery as a, as a kind of assisted natural recovery. And what the, the research on physical rivers actually shows us is that when you work with that natural energy of a river system, that actually by doing um, that kind of an approach, less intervention, less intensive intervention can actually deliver more. So you can get more for doing less, uh, which obviously makes really good sense. It's more sustainable in terms of cost at the time of delivering interventions. And also going forward in time, you're working with nature. So the maintenance and the management um, going forward de delivers more benefits for people and biodiversity in the longer term if you take that approach. So if we move on to the next slide, thinking bigger, wherever we can, if we can use the space and look at the space that we're we're working and obviously we're thinking about development here so we haven't always got the chance to do a full-scale river restoration maybe if we're lucky we've got some opportunities off-site um, where things can't be delivered on site but obviously we're following the mitigation hierarchy so we want to look on site first of all but please we must think about the wider context we want to think about building up more resilient catchments because these Systems, these aquatic systems are made up of numerous interconnected habitats. So we're thinking landscape scale and we're thinking about connectivity here in what we are, are going to aim for in, in getting healthier systems. Because all of the, the, the water that's flowing through the system is helping to connect um, the, the movement of sediment and the sustaining of the vegetation and the organic materials that's that in there that are underpinning the biodiversity within our aquatic ecosystems. So by thinking and taking action at the system scale across this full range of different environments, by doing that, we can deliver multiple benefits. And this will give us more sustainable physical habitats to support healthier and more biodiverse ecosystems again. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. So connect or 
perhaps even reconnect in many cases is, is what we really need to be thinking about here. We need to restore the connectivity between different environments and talked about, Sarah mentioned this interface between the terrestrial and the aquatic. And of course, there is a dynamic interface there. And we want to make sure that we have natural movement of water, sediment, and water dependent organisms across these boundaries, because this gives more resilience to the system. You know, we're, we know that we are increasingly being faced with extreme events, such as drought sometimes, or even storms. And by helping to increase that connectivity by removing barriers between and within those environments, we can actually help to um, make more, you know, biodiverse systems that have got more sustainability, more, more resilience in the longer term. So we're talking about the floodplain. We're talking about the hyperaic zone, which is this an area underneath the actual riverbed itself, uh, which is really important in systems, perhaps where water levels sometimes get very low. And there we have groundwater that's sustaining the base flows. Okay, next slide, please. Natural recovery or even assisted recovery takes time. And wherever possible, we do need to allow space and time for the natural processes to occur and for ecosystems to recover. And we need time for physical habitats to be generated sometimes after interventions have gone in, for vegetation to grow back and for, for whole system recovery. Rivers and coasts have amazing resilience and, and they can recover really well when they're given that space. And these systems will be more resilient in the face of the natural fluctuations that will occur in nature. We have to accept that we have a changing dynamic um, weather, climate, environments, all of these things are changing at different rates of time. And we need to know that we can give space to nature and that that can be um, possible without damaging important infrastructure. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So what we need to do together is to think about planning for all of these things that we've just mentioned there and prioritizing things and perhaps being a little bit less opportunity driven if we can. There's a lot of the work that's been done on rivers in the past has been very opportunistic. So if we can plan ahead and prioritize along these creep key principles, it will help to deliver more for our rivers. And if we coordinate more of this restoration effort, effort working together, breaking down the barriers between the different disciplines and planning to improve the morphology alongside of all the other aspects of the environment that uh, we need to you know, bring everything forward together, coordinating that effort across land and water will really pay back in the longer term. Okay, so just if we go to the next slide, we're bringing it all together. Really important to think in a connected way about all of these concepts. And if we want to help our rivers and water dependent wildlife, we have this wonderful opportunity now through biodiversity net gain and, and considering all of these principles is really going to help. And if you take just one thing away from this webinar, I think it would be to work with nature and natural processes and that all the rest will, will fall into place as well. We can seek out and work with other trained geomorphologists if you get the chance. Um, will really help the rivers to recover in the longer term, and then they'll be supporting that, that better diversity. Another quick thing to mention here at the end is thinking about the catchment scale to look out for the catchment partnerships and the catchment action plans, um, because often there'll be very practical information. These are all the principal ideas, but practically speaking, many measures are already um, being identified within catchments through catchment partnerships. And there may already be projects that are there just on the shelf waiting to be delivered. Um, and, and also the local catchment partnerships may have connections with landowners, all those things which will really help you very practically to deliver net gain um, when it comes down to it. Okay, I think that's-, that's I think, um, I love this. Yeah, I love a checklist. You know, when you get to water course and BNG, let nature do the work, think bigger connect give space and time plan and prioritize and i think it, it speaks very much to the heart of bng and that kind of collective community that yes you know we do have these individual development projects but let's all 
you know, collectively work together, especially on um, these river restoration points. And I think, you know, we know that's not going to magically happen over time, but as something to work towards, particularly, and we'll get into B&G watercourses and markets, it's great. On the 12th of February, so what does trigger watercourse net gain? And I do want to make this point because we have been in this space when it's like, well, do we have to do it? Well, maybe not because it's voluntary, but this is different now. We're crossing the line on the 12th of February. So could you take us through exactly what triggers um, from a mandatory watercourse net gain point of view? Yeah, sure. So um, really, it's when the red line boundary crosses into the river. And you can see here, we've got the red line boundary just coming into the well, it's on the right of my screen. Um, the key thing here is knowing what we mean by a river. Um, so it's the channel, it's the banks, and it's this thing called the riparian zone that you can see here, the 10 meter zone from the top of banks. So it's all of that together. Um, so some people think of a river being just the channel and it's not. The river isn't a pipe of water uh, and the riparian zone is this area of 10 metres back from the top of the bank that fundamentally influences the ecological function of the river. So it's critical. So th this riparian zone, um, it's inputting uh, river to the river organic matter. It's an area of deposition of erosion. Uh, it's a wildlife corridor for species such as otters or bats. And importantly, it controls the temperature that's going on in the channel. So it controls, it, it's creating areas of light and dark. So any development in that zone uh, triggers the watercourses module. And I think people sometimes say, well, it's really difficult to find where the riparian zone is. You know, you've said in the guidance, it's where there's a break of slope. And Lucy's already given like your key takeaway from this is working in natural processes. My other key takeaway is think about the riparian zone as where you build a shed, okay? It's, you wouldn't build a shed anywhere on that slopey bank bit. You're really thinking about where it's starting to break out in, in that kind of flatter area. So think about that as where that, that riparian zone starts. Um, there is this kind of interface here with the area part of the metric. We, we can't, you know, that's there. So, um, and I always use the example here of, you know, wet woodland, because we can imagine the wet woodland being in the riparian zone and it's being picked up in the area part of the habitat. But think about all the things that that wet woodland is doing to the channel, the inputs it's ha having, the areas of light and shade that it's ha having. So you've also just got to think about the riparian zone. This bit here is helping the river function. It's the functional part, but the actual habitat is also going into the area part. And you can see at the bottom there, um, we've got a sort of dashed line um, just at the bottom of the bank and the area habitat very generally goes down, um, right down to that, that bank, bank toe. Okay, so, so um, just to clarify, if any part of the red line boundary for a development seeking planning permission is within the riparian zone, that triggers watercourse net gain. So the river can be out, but the red line boundary can be one metre within that 10 metre riparian zone and that triggers watercourse net gain. That's correct. One and... more click, Julia. There you go. Oh, there we it. go. Sorry to and... interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Um, and obviously we've got the riparian zone, which is, um, if you like, like you said, I'm fascinating about the temperature bit. I didn't know that actually. But, you know, in terms of that functioning of the river, but for those familiar with the metric, there's the green box habitats, the area-based habitats and the brown box, the hedgerows, the line of trees. So if they're in the riparian zone, they are still within those individual modules in the metric. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, exactly. So I guess, I mean, this is, I, I I just want to ask for some help you know how do we I mean it, it's you know for a long time it has been quite tricky but I I love the way actually that you say the water course metric does ask you to say what you see like fundamentally it does ask you to say what you see but do we have to create new rivers to get to water course BNG what what are, what are the tricks of the trade 
Am I jumping in here? Yes, no, no, we definitely don't need to, to create new rivers. Definitely not about creating new rivers. What we're aiming to do is to restore or enhance our, our existing river systems. And, and there are many ways that we can uplift um, that, that existing condition or other in fact, other things about the river too. Um, there's there's lots of different things that we can do. So if we we've got a nice combination here on this slide about how we can achieve that uplift. And if we start off with distinctiveness and keeping in mind that we do have some really important trading rules, which reflect the obvious non-starters, so we we can't do things like compensate loss of of river habitats or a section of river by enhancing a ditch. Um, but apart from that, if you do have a site which has got potential to support the recovery of a very highly natural section of river, you know, if you could get your river up to a highly naturally functioning state, then you could increase that distinctiveness there. And of course, uh, for all of our sadly buried and culverted uh, rivers or even ditches that are culverted, we could improve that distinctiveness band there as well by just giving them the light of day. Um, if we move then to condition, as I said, for the river condition assessment, we do a field survey and what we're looking at is all of the different attributes in the river channel on the bank face and on the bank top. So across all of these different zones within the channel, uh, we can look at ways of reducing those negative pressures and increasing the positive attributes um, and, the, and the natural functioning of the watercourse within those, those separate parts of the channel. Most importantly, thinking about what's appropriate for that river in that place. We've got two different types of things. We've got different types of watercourse, which are covered by distinctiveness. And then we've got different river types. And this is the geomorphic river type that we need to, to keep in mind. And you learn all about when you're, you're doing river condition assessment. So that makes sure that it's the right habitat in the right place for that, that kind of river. And what we also really love about the watercourse metric is that there are two extra ways that you can achieve uplift, and that is through encroachment. So by addressing encroachment either in the riparian zone, which is that bank top area within 10 metres, or in the watercourse itself, if we remove those pressures, that hard engineering, or in fact it could be land management as well, if we can address those things um, in our target condition, post-intervention, those are two really great ways to also contribute in the calculations towards improvement and uplifting that condition, removing structures that are now obsolete. Um, many rivers have got historic features within them, no longer serving any useful or practical purpose. And where that is the case and they can be removed um, without any risk, then it's a really quick win. So and those are just the physical aspects. Yeah, and we, you do give us two extra ones, actually, because you're right. In the other modules of the metric, you know, the encroachment in the watercourses, you, you get such a flexibility and um, vari uh, variety, actually, of different options. And I guess, I mean, just coming back to this, um, I, or maybe let's stick on this one. You know, sometimes it's quite a small area. We might have a small number of units. So I guess the encroachment one would be a consideration. And where, where do people start, you know, if, they, if they're thinking, right, I need watercourse net gain? Um, where do they start with this? Well, even before going to site, I, it's really worthwhile, as we said before, if we go to the next slide, actually thinking about the whole catchment and the context of the catchment, consider the whole system. Uh, before we go to site, we can do a lot actually through desk study. Um, we need to think about, you know, where are the opportunities and where are the limitations, to be honest, because there could still be some limitations to the potential improvements for the sections of river that we're really interested in. Um, so there's some really great resources out there that I wanted to highlight today, um, particularly the catchment based approach website. I've already mentioned catchment partnerships and catchment action plans. And if you're not already working with rivers, you might not know about the amazing wealth of information that is out there um, on the, the catchment based approach website. And, and you know, these are 
DEFRA policies, which are fantastic. They've been in place for years and the website's hosted by the, the Rivers Trust, the National Rivers Trust. And it provides a lot of really useful information, not just for learning about rivers, but also in a very practical way, you can actually identify who is the catchment host. And through that, you can get to these catchment action plans, which may have potential projects uh, sitting on the shelf in that particular catchment. And many catchment partnerships now have their action plans online and in the form of um, story maps uh, because the CABA also have a data hub and lots of GIS layers with loads of information that sit behind all of the uh, the planning and the management and the, everything that is going on in the partnership. So if you check out those resources, you often find that lots of people have done a lot of information gathering already, and that's available out there. And you can find out, you know, a lot of the opportunity. And thinking about what's happened in the past in catchments, we need to bear in mind, you know, through through that what will be possible in the future as well. Also, uh, organisations like the River Restoration Centre, which provides some excellent learning materials as well, and training, and also case studies. And there's a, a great river wiki where you can find examples and often also lessons learned from many years of river restoration. So I love, I love what you're saying because yeah. it's like think design. You know, I think as yeah. ecologists, and that's the driving seat of, you know, we're now in the driving seat of B&G. We're not just going out to survey. No, 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 think design and really get in that mindset before you get out on site. Absolutely. Coming to the survey, though, where do we start? What do we do? Take us through some handy hints about this one. Yeah, so that, that's over to me. So this is this is a lovely extract um, from the user guide. And what I wanted to really get across here is thinking about the river in sections. And if I'm going back to that thing about storytelling, think about this river as these chapters, the different chapters that you've got on site. So I think what sometimes happens is that you've got a site from A to B, uh, and sometimes instead of breaking up into sections, it's just put in as one line. And as you can see here, the story that's going on on this site is that you've got a river that's in good condition, then you've got a bit of river that's in culvert, then you've got another bit that's in good condition, and then you've got another bit in poor or, or moderate condition. So this site has been sectioned, sectioned into four different lines, okay? So that's what I just want you to, this is the output that you want at the end. So, so, so would this be one river? This is one your, river. This okay, is one got site. You. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So you break it down in terms of that metric and really yeah. think about, yeah. Yeah. So if we go into the next slide, I've got an example. Yeah. So when you're on site, so you've done all the thinking that, that Lucy uh, went through, but this is again about, you know, storytelling. Um, and it's about really walking the site first. Um, instead of thinking about, okay, we've got this set big long length of river that we need to look at and we're just going to go in and start walk the site, maybe walk the site first and let okay, let the, the river tell the story. Um, you know, you're looking at what's happening on both banks. You're looking at sort of differences, similarities, opportunities. Um, and I've put here, you know, take a thermos. <laughs> this is key. And the other thing I should have put is actually take the metric user guide and just have it, you know, the water course module bit, you know, out with you because it really helps when you're thinking about what is riparian encroachment and what's in channel encroachment um but yeah so for example in this um for this section of river we've split it into four sections okay so the first section at the top it's gone in as one section because it's got a weir in it it's got a weir in an impounded reach the second section is over a road bridge so that's fundamentally different Okay, the third section moving down, this is an area that we're retaining and the fourth uh, section, that's an area that we want to enhance. So each of these will be a separate line in the metric and therefore we'll have all this, you know, the inputs that you need, the condition assessment, excuse me, <clears throat> the condition assessment, the encroachment multipliers, all of those in each line for each section. So some people will be thinking, oh, 
Okay, well, how does this work with a condition assessment that has a very, you know, strict, I suppose, um, amount of line or, or distance that you need? So I'm going to hand over to Lucy just to think about how do our sections fit with river condition assessment? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's that's a brilliant um lead into this because we always when we're training people through the same training on the water course metric introductory course talk about the importance of going to site and doing the walk over to scope out where these sections will be you've had a look on your desk study to have a bit of an idea of that in the first place and you'll know where things are planned or where things are not going to be getting changed but when, when you really get down to the site that you need to do that initial walk over and delineate those those lengths so that you're comfortable with where they start and end and then we need to think about where are we going to do our sample sub reach surveys using the morph method which I just described before a little bit and the way the morph methodology works is that it basically you you do surveys which are a bit like putting a quadrat over the river um, so you will scale the size of your imaginary quadrat, your length of river that you're surveying, to the width of your channel. Because the way that features appear in rivers will also be scaled to that system. So if you've got a small river, we'll do the shortest mod morph module length, which is 10 meters. And then as we go up, we will roughly do a length of channel that's double the width, very approximately. And that will then need to be done five times side by side to get a sub reach because this will pick up a little bit more of the diversity than just looking at one of those sections in isolation. The modules in isolation do give you some useful info, but putting them together will give you a lot more to work with. So we need those five by five surveys. So that is a minimum of 50 meters for a small stream up to five meters. And then it goes up to a maximum length of 50 meters for each module. So that could be 250 meters on a very large river. And that's fine if we've got a channel, say in the example that we're seeing here, I'm just hazarding a guess that this perhaps might be um, 10 meter modules individually if that channel is is under five meters wide or perhaps 10 meters uh, or up to 20 meters so 100 meters if it was the next sort of increment up and I think in the um, three of those four sections that we're seeing here we'd probably comfortably fit in five side by side morph modules. Um, questions that often come up are but what do I do if my river section is actually shorter than my more five survey and my more five sub reach? What should I do? And it's a really, really important question because in order to generate the necessary outputs to determine your condition, um, you do need those five sets of data and the system that we have this information system where the data is saved will recognize when you've input five sets of morph data and do the calculation for you you can do it yourself by hand if you want there's a guidance manual which tells you all of the calculations too but in order to make that process more speedy for you give you the detailed outputs you do it within an uh, information system and that will generate it for you. But you do need those five results. So so what do we do if we've got a short length? And in fact, what do we do, you know, when we've got a longer length? So just to flip it around for a moment, get you thinking about this, you know, you could think, well, first of all, if we go to the shorter length, you could think, okay, well, I, maybe I can see a bit upstream and downstream. Should I include that as well? But you've got to think very carefully about what the objective is for your river assessment. Uh, we want to get a representative sample through that more five subreach length, which is a bit like, you know, those sort of quadrat type samples. And you want to relate that to the whole length that you're putting in the line that Sarah's just described which is in your metric tool. So for a longer length, what you're going to be doing is kind of extrapolating that information to the longer length. And that makes sense, right? That's okay. And you need to cover at least 20% of that longer length to make sure you're getting really representative information there. For a shorter length, what do we do? We need to extrapolate, but we might need to do it in a slightly different way. Obviously, we've got to think really carefully if we're going to um, somehow either Perhaps if you were on a threshold of being a little bit over, you might go for a slightly shorter 
morph module length. And I say this with extreme caution because you really need to make a decision based on what is happening at the site that you're working on. Another way of doing it might be to duplicate some of the morph module data that you've gathered in the field. Again, whatever you choose to do, you need to think about how that is going to affect your data because it won't be comparable to other parts of the system, other sites, especially if you're going to adjust that module length. The, the really Lucy. important take home on this is to make sure whatever you do is that you you take account of it and you make a note and you think about how it's affecting your data. And then you think this is baseline. And how is that then going to um, affect my target condition, my projection um, going forward? So sorry, a little bit of the detail there. No, it's but, great. Uh, no, I think it's really important. Because it is a question that comes up a lot. <laughs> yeah. In the final 10 minutes, let's let's go through this one. But I really want to get into markets. OK, so can you quickly take us through this one and then let's finish up with B&G markets for water courses, because that's a big you, question. Yeah. Keeping an eye on the time for us. An excellent chair. Thank you. Um, very quickly on this one, another really common question that comes up uh, does relate to distinctiveness and what is my water course? And very often this is the the million dollar question around is it a, a river? Is it a dish? It's not million dollars, but it's, it's really significance in terms of the banding for distinctiveness. So it's really important that we get it right. And we know that you know, by simple definition, a ditch will be an artificial channel compared to a natural river or stream. So, and to be honest, with all of the, you know, engineering that's gone over time with natural rivers, it can even be for experts a very difficult question sometimes. So the key takeaways on this are to, when you're at site, look at the landscape, think about, you know, are we in a, a natural depression? Is there natural drainage of water here or has that water channel been artificially constructed when you're doing your death study look at the mapping look at the historic maps there are some great resources out there look for clues um, in the mapping can you see any wiggly bits upstream and downstream because that means even though you're looking at a straight bit it might have been straightened from being a natural water course and it's not to say that it's a bad thing if it's a ditch because you can get some amazing ditch habitats you can do fantastic like restoration but yeah. we want to make sure that we're not you know missing the opportunity to restore just a very heavily modified um, river or stream there especially if it's an upland headwater yeah I love those historical maps I think they're really good Sarah are chalk rivers What's the distinctiveness go on chalk rivers? Because there was a, a moment when any chalk river would be very high distinctiveness. What's yeah, the lowdown down on chalk rivers? Sure, if you could just skip to a slide on priority rivers. Is that one? Yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah, so I'll be honest, the, the priority river habitats and the definition of this has evolved over time. And so since 2014, Priority river habitats are based on naturalness criteria. So they have to be incredibly natural. They have to have great water chemistry, morphology, hydrology, and biology. So they need all four of those. Um, and I'll be honest, the way that this is communicated in the literature and on, on guidance, and it it can be quite um it can be quite difficult, difficult to follow. Um, but what we've given you um, is the .gov map on naturalness. That is your priority river habitat map. So if it's on that map, it goes in as very high distinctiveness. But as you're right, what's going on with chalk rivers? Do I hate chalk rivers and I've ignored them? No, I haven't. So um, priority river habitats are so these natural, natural rivers. The priority rivers, they're called priority river types. So they're almost working alongside of this. Chalk rivers are still a huge priority for us to restore, um, as well as headwaters, active shingle rivers, but they're called priority river types. It's a very much a terminology thing. We've also got at the bottom here, we've got feeders coming in. So there are maps that look at priority rivers for restoration. So these are the ones that have been identified as those that really could need some restoration. And if we do that, they'll then feed in to this kind of naturalness um, priority river habitat there. Okay, so just to be clear, it's the priority river habitat map. That's the yes, go-to. Brilliant. And that's okay. the guidance. And there it is. There's the link. Oh, fantastic. So we've got some really good resources. We've got the historical maps. Think those catchment 
um, plans. I'm going to dive into those and that priority habitat map. And I, I just want to, we can come back to this because I really do want to touch on, firstly, welcome to the party. We've got a watercourse metric trading tab, finally. Finally, guys. So everyone in the draft statutory metric, we have a trading tab specifically for watercourses. If you're not quite sure what trading is, we do loads of it in the metric um, training courses. But just to highlight, that's the new one for this. Just to finish off, though, um, I've certainly worked on projects when it's like, well, can I have two watercourse unit, please? You know, we can't do it on site. And, you know, my developer's going, well, June, I'm not going to restore an, you know, entire river. And I just think there's, from what you've just said, it's such an inspiration to really encourage a thriving offset market where these, you know, everything's adding up to these restoration projects. What's your thoughts on this? And and can we do watercourse BNG in an urban environment? Yeah, sure. So there is definitely a demand uh, for river units. And I think, you know, um, rivers were put in the too difficult box, but now we're we're having properly embraced it through mandatory. So we're really seeing uh, the demand for watercourse units increasing. Uh, we can see that through some work the DEFRA commissioned last year, but definitely on the ground, the feeling has changed. So more market providers want to know how, how to understand how to get into the market and we're talking to them. More trusts are talking about, again, how to set up uh, net gain delivery sites. Um, so the emphasis is now on if there'll be a BNG market, it's more how, how are we gonna do it? Um, so it's a really, really exciting space. Um, yeah, and I suppose river restoration schemes, they can be costly, um, but not all. You know, but for the costly ones, you know, it's understanding those wider ecosystem service benefits that's going to really help um, because there could be op there are opportunities for kind of blended finance schemes associated and BNG in those cases could become really important seed funding. So, you know, wider benefits of river restoration, we are talking about flood, flood regulation, climate resilience, um, water quality, water quality benefits recreation benefits and if we think about those ecosystem services um, we could be thinking about different investment options where it becomes a blended um, project obviously understanding the the stacking and bundling rules in there yeah, yeah and I just think it's you know it's it is now the demand that's coming through for water courses and especially those one or two units if we can I think there's that cross-sector collaboration, you know, really start to reach out for those doing fantastic river restoration projects. And hopefully this will all stack up. Lucy, what's your thoughts on this? Oh, I, I've got so much to say on this, but we don't have time, sadly. But Urban River is very close to my heart. Huge opportunities there. Uh, they can be absolute hidden gems to showing you the potential of Urban Rivers. They can really be a bit like the Cinderella that's before they go to the ball. But yes, maybe it could be a bit costly, but the paybacks are huge. Um, you know, we've got to where we are today because of this they call it death by a thousand cuts, you know, the, the incremental deterioration of our watercourses. And so by doing even a little bit in a small section of river, you know, we're turning that around and we're starting to build a legacy for future generations, turning around what we've inherited from the legacy of the past. So I would always say be inspired. There's loads of, you know, benefit, not just to development sites. We know how great those water sides look with the buildings when they're you know, it look just it's just great. It's great for win win for people um and for wildlife because it's all about the biodiversity, but it's what we can also benefit from by having nature in our towns and cities. Working with urban rivers is really satisfying. It can be challenging. Of course, we know there are issues with water quality. Lots of people talk about that. But by the more people see what can be done physically to change the rivers, trust me, the conversations start people start talking to each other and things do start to change and I'm seeing it happen in practice it's such an exciting time to be involved in this work with rivers um, not just in the urban settings across the whole country but it's it's great so put your faith in it and you know have the conversations with others and, and the catchment partnerships because you will see examples and be inspired. And I think it's you know it's, it is coming now to mandatory net gain you know no works can start 
until that biodiversity gain plan is approved by the local planning authority. And that means all of BNG has to be signed, sealed and delivered. And I think what you've just said in terms of don't just wander onto site, right? Really think you've got a river, you can see it before you get to site. Walk the river, understand the story, but really think about water course net gain as early as possible. And let's front load this whole discussion final moments and i know there's loads of questions in the chat so we will absolutely digest them and and come back to them afterwards what is your wish list i mean you're you're kind of you've worked on this for so long you've really been you know like coming up to uh watercourse bng and in a way now you're handing it over to industry in that sense sarah it started with you and then lucy yeah i suppose it's about incentivizing delivery that we've just spoken about it's about making it happen so the button is over to you to make it happen and I think that's going to happen with an industry that has confidence in the method confidence in how the delivery works and confidence in working with landowners and if we put rivers in the too difficult box still it, it won't happen so um, my wish is that you know, I guess in five years time we are armed with amazing case files of best practice. We've got a really thriving community of practice um, and that working on rivers is for an industry in ecology just becomes absolute everyday, everyday practice. So there you go, that's my wish. Okay, I'll sign up to that one, Lucy. If I just add, yeah, I mean, this thing of working together to achieve more um, is really the thing for me. We've been talking a lot about wanting to establish a community of good practice. And I think this webinar, you know, the amount of people that have joined this event, and I know there's a waiting list as well, is really testimony to the fact that people are interested. Yeah, we put together some, some resources. And if we just flip to the previous uh, slide again, we've got you know, there's loads going on in this area around the water courses. We've got great training opportunities there. Um, you can just go and, you know, learn more yourself from the resources that are out there online, some of which we've pointed to. And we've got the links at the final slide, which you'll be able to look at later. But also this community of good practice is really starting to, to get going. And everything that we've been doing is really trying to bring people on this journey. We know it's the beginning. Um, yes, there's been quite a lot of river restoration going on with this bit of a niche area and it's now really extending to to a wider um, community and I'm so happy to be working with ecologists that often haven't done very much work on rivers before and to say you know hear the feedback and say they really enjoyed the whole process of learning and getting involved in this and they're comfortable with the approach so you know we want to let that spread wider but also be there for people to ask questions and to be able to help because we haven't had enough time to have many case studies based on specifically the delivery of biodiversity net gain. So we really want to hear about what's coming up for people as well. And obviously DEFRA have got the um, email that you can send information back to, but hopefully through all the other channels that you'll get connected with, you know, let's, let's, let's get a really good set of information and build our confidence around this going forwards. And thank you so much because you know, as always, you two have just when we were talking about the webinars, we're like, hello, watercourses. So, yes, please. And thank you. I was speaking with one of our um, graduates this week about, you know, biodiversity net gain. And I was asking her what she was really excited about. And she, I mean, she's um, recently started work and, and come into this industry. So she hasn't, you know, been kind of a, had the emotional journey of biodiversity net gain. And I said, you know, are you excited about anything particular? She goes, rivers rivers you know yeah. and it's just really coming through yeah. in terms of she really understood just the potential that could be there so we're not saying it's going to happen overnight um we're not saying you know we're suddenly getting get these large river restoration projects but we are saying let's work together let's absolutely work together and the fact that you two have come on and i'm absolutely now team river watercourse bng absolutely so everyone thank you so much we have hit time and all of your questions we are definitely going to download those and go through them i promise we've still got the questions from the last webinars as well so watch this space for more um, we will be in touch and there'll be more webinars and also this community discussion about bng let's make it all happen but for the meantime sarah lucy thank you so much watercourse bng thank you very much Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone.